Ken Rogoff uh, is very well known. Um, I'll just give a brief, brief CV. Uh, Thomas is Thomas D. Cabell Professor at Harvard. Uh, Ro uh, Ken was also a chief economist at the, at the IMF. And one of his most known works is his widely cited uh, work with Carmen Reinhardt, This Time is Different, uh, which shows that uh, there are a number of high similarities across time and countries in the run-up and aftermath of severe uh, financial uh, crisis. Uh, Ken is uh, well known for his work on exchange rates and on central bank independence and open economy macro. He is uh, an elected member of the National Academy of Science, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Group of 30. He is a senior fellow at the Council of Foreign Relations. Uh, he's one of the top ranked economists by scholarly citations, and he holds a PhD in economics from MIT. He will give us uh, the keynote speech on how to restore monetary policy effectiveness. Thank you very much and uh, for everyone for being here. Uh, thank you to the Central Bank uh, of Chile uh, for hosting this. Um, the uh, uh, speech I'm going to give today, I should say, is uh, a variation of one that I gave in April uh, at the Group of 30 lecture at the IMF meetings. I was a last minute substitute for uh, Marty Feldstein, who you know, sadly passed away recently. Um, he, uh, I, d I don't think he quite realized how ill he was, but he withdrew from giving the lecture just two weeks in advance, and I was asked to substitute uh, for him. Uh, and all I knew is that he had a chosen the title, The Beginning of the End, a and I'm, I'm sure that referred to a policy issue, not himself, uh, from uh, other information. But I, 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 don't, I didn't really know what he was going to talk about. I wish I did know what he was going to talk about. Uh, so I didn't have the imagination to quite cover the whole world as he might have. So I entitled mine The Beginning of the End of Central Bank Independence, uh, which has you know, certainly been uh, uh, an, import, an important theme. And we've heard a lot about it um, already here from the central bank governors themselves. Um, and uh, just, just to reiterate some things that I think have been said already, uh, on the political side, and particularly after the financial crisis, the public has come to expect the central bank to take on more and more responsibilities, and some of these really aren't vaguely within the power of their remit. I remember you know, Janet Yellen giving speeches on fighting inequality, uh, virtually guaranteeing that every last ex-con would have a job. Um, there's just limits to what the Federal Reserve uh, and what any central bank uh, can do. Um, and then uh, on, on top of that, there are, of course, an increasing number of populist proposals that sort of forget why we have an independent central bank, thinking we can just use that as a cash cow, inflation's dead, uh, why not just print money to pay for stuff? Uh, so that's certainly, that's certainly a theme. Uh, and, and then I think there's some genuine uh, technocratic issues that central banks are facing. One very important one I'll talk about at the end of this um, speech is about the decline in global real interest rates, which I think poses a lot of challenges. I think there's a real question of what to do about it. Um, I, I'm going to argue that central banks in general and governments need to be more imaginative of, and more expansive in what they consider, and in particular uh, trying to uh, institute uh, effective negative interest rate policy. I'm happy Mike Bordeaux is here because he's one of the two other people in the world who believe this, uh, but uh, I'm going to try to convince you of it anyway. Um, I think that in the meantime, central banks have tried to put a good face on what they call alternative monetary instruments, uh, such as quantitative easing, uh, which I, I just think are no substitute for genuinely effective uh, monetary policies. Um, I want to um, highlight um, a couple issues, particularly that are related both to my distant past work uh, and also my more recent work. Uh, 
And first, I want to argue that part of the problem is that although it's true, central banks have become victims of their own success. Inflation's so low. A lot of not just pop, you know, academics believe it just can't come back. It's impossible. Uh, it's dead. Uh, we we should give them, make them exchange students to certain countries in Latin America, uh, but uh, that that program hasn't started yet. Uh, but I also think there's there's been some extent to which central banks have been somewhat dogmatic, and I've referred elsewhere uh, to inflation targeting evangelism, which has left them uh, somewhat too inflexible with dealing with outside the box events, things. Uh, which m you might think of nighty and uncertainty in economics journal, uh, economics targets, stuff happens that you just didn't imagine, and you need a framework that, uh, that can deal with that. Um, I think a second, uh, a second issue, um, which is uh, coming at the, towards the end, is that central banks have, I think, been a little slow and reluctant to deal with changes in the payments and financial environment that create opportunities for rethinking monetary policy. I want to start, uh, if you can forgive me, with a bit of distant uh, uh, history uh, and talk about my 1985 paper, uh, uh, which was in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, entitled The Optimal Degree of Commitment to an Intermediate Monetary Target. I actually was at the Federal Reserve when I wrote this on leave at the IMF. It was an IMF working paper in 1982. Uh, and then a, a Fed working paper. Uh, just to, it, it was a very different world back then in terms of getting anything out that you wanted to say about monetary policy. I, I, first of all, when I was writing the paper, um, no one was there at night at the Federal Reserve unless it was you know, the, one of the people assisting Volcker with making monetary policy. I literally would walk out at, say, 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and the guards would be asleep. I could have been carrying out a suitcase of confidential documents, and no one would care. Uh, however, if you wanted to publish a working paper, they did care a lot, and my paper had nominal GDP targeting as one of the ideas uh, that it had in it, and everybody, my colleagues, said, you will never, ever get this. The Fed doesn't want this. But happily, they didn't read it, and they approved it, and I was able to uh, get it out. Uh, what the paper uh, was about was uh, I was trying to address the time inconsistency problem that Kidland and Prescott and later Barrow and Gordon had identified. Um, but um, the, the novel part of the paper was delegating monetary policy to an independent central bank. Now, um, I got this paper summarily. It was rejected at IMF staff papers. I won't get into that. But it was rejected at the American Economic Review, the JP, and sort of return mail. Uh, and the general view was this, this was a super game. Institutions weren't going to do anything. Uh, and that was the reaction I got. If uh, you created a, an independent central bank, it was a mere veil. And the government could get rid of it any time it felt like it. And I think um, uh, it's true, it's difficult to do it legally in the same sense. And uh, I, I, uh, it has been said yesterday that central banks need to fight every day for their independence. But there are some frictions, I think, that give it, uh, that give it meaning. Uh, and uh, now, nowadays, I'd, I'd probably get it rejected because uh, all, all your success as an independent central bank depends on your colonial institutions, and therefore, you know, what does it matter if you try to create an independent monetary authority? It won't change your future anyway. Um, but I, I think the, the whole uh, success of the central banks in emerging markets and in many different countries is a uh, testimony to that there, there, somehow there is power to this idea of delegating to an independent central bank. Now, my 1985 paper is sometimes referred to as my conservative central bank paper, and that kind of referred to that. Actually, the, t the title of the paper uh, is Optimal Degree of Commitment to an Intermediate Target. I look at, uh, I introduce the idea of inflation targeting, uh, I mentioned nominal GDP, par GDP targeting, interest rate targeting, money targeting. And as the title of the paper uh, indicates, um, it was trying to look at the trade-off 
uh, between credibility and flexibility. Um, and I, I took Milton Friedman's idea. He wanted to have a constitutional amendment to fix the money supply growth and gave that as an example of nighting uncertainty that it just would have been a disaster. It was hard to imagine what would happen, uh, but it did. Um, later on, um, uh, uh, Bob Flood and Peter Izard wrote a paper in 1989 uh, and Susanna Lohman in 1992 that I think offered a better way to manage the trade-off between credibility and flexibility. Uh, both of them view an idea in the case of Flood and Izard an escape clause, in the case of Lohman the option of firing the central banker uh, as a way of trying to um, commit in normal times but have the flexibility in, uh, uh, in more extreme events and of course we have here uh, uh, Marina Halleck, uh, Halleck and Pierre Yaret have written wonderful papers on uh, these trade-offs looking much more deeply and I guess Pierre will give one later. Uh, I'll lastly say that when I, was, when I wrote the paper on inflation targeting, I, I, I didn't think of the inflation target as something that would be permanent and sacrosanct, uh, but something that could be varied over time. Um, so uh, I, I mean, of course, you know, at the time I wrote it, there were actually only a couple countries had independent central banks. And uh, since then, that's been a uh, big movement. I, I would maintain, had the euro never been formed, and Spain, Italy, Portugal, and Greece had independent central banks, they would have gotten inflation down, which was 99% of the reason that the people supported having the euro, and they'd be a lot happier today than with the system that they have. My apologies to... Uh, the, the euro uh, and wishing it the best of luck, but I think as far as uh, doing it to bring down inflation, that was misguided. Now, um, later, the literature evolved, uh, and uh, I think most notably John Taylor in 1993, um, famously, and Lars Svensson came later, uh, 1996, basically arguing if you get the rule right, there's no trade-off between commitment and flexibility. Uh, you don't really, if you have a really good rule and you stick strongly to it, um, your stabilization is going to be great. It's not an issue. I, I, would, I would say that events of the uh, financial crisis and even running up to that undermine this view. Now, Taylor's is much more narrow. He says what the rule is. Svensson's is more vague and so a, a little bit more flexible in that sense. Uh, but of course, you know, in the original Taylor rule, he had 4% as the normal interest rate. And he, he, no, who would have imagined that real interest rates would have fallen so much? And the Fed today is struggling over whether the normal equilibrium interest rates, 2.5%, 2%, 2 uh, or what. And so very similar to Friedman with his constitutional amendment, it's hard to keep a rule in uh, permanently. Uh, and uh, again, Svensson's forecast targeting is newer. It's va a lot vaguer than uh, Taylor's. Uh, uh, it has its own issues, but I'll no I, I noticed I was at the Chicago conference that Mike Bordeaux referred to earlier, and Lars has started to say, well, we probably should have an escape clause uh, in there. Uh, so I feel like we've kind of come full circle. And I want to say, when you have an escape clause, it affects and you can see this from the Lohman and the Flood and Izard and uh, uh, more recent work, it affects the expected inflation rate. If there's an option that you might end up needing to inflate or deflate someday, uh, more, more likely inflate, uh, it's going to affect in expected inflation, but it might be, uh, it might be worth it. Um, so I'll, co I'll, co I'll, co I'll, come, I'll come back. I'll, I'll come back to this, but uh, certainly the idea of having an independent central bank today, which is under attack, uh, comes from all these people who believe inflation can't happen in the 21st century and we don't really need it. And I, I will say we will see this in some countries. We have seen it in some countries. When you lose central bank independence, it's not that easy to get it back. It's not that easy to get your inflation credibility uh, back. <clears throat> uh, I want to look at four challenges facing uh, central bankers today. Uh, 
And I'd say many of them come not from being too powerful, but struggling to remain relevant. So first of all, I've mentioned that global inflation uh, has, uh, has fallen a lot. Um, I, I, I also um, say that the fact that monetary policy seems to be much less effective at the zero bound has also been a challenge for uh, central banks. And I, there's a literature on this. There, there are debates on just how powerful is QE. I don't think many people take seriously the idea that QE or any forward guidance or any of these things are an effective substitute for normal monetary policy. Uh, and, and by the way, there was a lot of learning going on that's a little bit hard to separate out. Uh, in, a, in an earlier paper with Andrew Lilly, who's a graduate student at Harvard, uh, we looked at some of the expectations in the 2011 to 2013 period where there, there were, uh, you could find uh, options and prices on how much would you pay uh, to insure your bonds against the possibility that inflation over the next decade would be 50% or more. And they were significant. I mean, it wasn't just crazy academics like Alan Meltzer. He's not crazy, he's brilliant. It wasn't just academics like Alan Meltzer saying that might be a problem and their dynamics to which it, uh, it could have been a problem. I, I think now those have sort of disappeared and I think if QA came back, it would operate differently because there has been learning about uh, what it does. Um, I, I, even within the Fed, which had really pushed hard and I would say pushed somewhat by the, the governors to show that QE was very effective, the papers that have been coming out have been dampening and dampening and dampening the, uh, the estimates of that. And uh, uh, a, a, f a fourth issue I think that faces central banks is this view that, well, you know, inflation's so low, uh, we can just keep raising debt, we'll never need to resort to inflation. And because we'll never need to resort to inflation, hey, why have an independent central bank? Uh, I think they're, they're uh, just a host of, a host of problems um, uh, facing uh, central banks. I, wa I want to start with this idea that the services of central bankers are no longer required. I, I can't help but retell a joke you must have heard if you've ever heard Jacob Frankel speak more than once, and I apologize, but it's just too perfect for this, uh, where Jacob describes this situation of the this uh, man who hasn't been as uh, good about uh, attending religious services as he should, and he's looking for a parking space in a very crowded parking lot. He can't find one, and he says, you know, uh, he looks up to heaven and says, you know, God, if you just give me a parking space, I will, you know, promise I'll, I'll go, you know, to religious services every week. I, I, I won't do this anymore. And suddenly, there's a parking space. And the man looks up and says, never mind. Um, and I think there's some, there's some relation to how people are going to feel about, uh, uh, about uh, independent, uh, independent central banks. I'm older than almost everyone in this room, uh, with maybe one or two exceptions. Uh, but back in 1992, there were 45 countries with over 40% inflation. Uh, and if you go back not that long, uh, the UK and Japan had 20% inflation in the 1970s. The US was in double digits. And I, I think it's, it's a very dangerous assumption to think that if you got rid of central bank independence, you would necessarily be able to replicate the same uh, performance. Of course, uh, today we're you know, in exactly the opposite situation. Uh, uh, Gita, I looked at the April IMF World Economic Outlook, which gave the forecast advanced economy inflation as 1.6%. Uh, I guess there was another forecast today. Did it go up or down? Around the same. Around the same. Uh, so uh, it's, it's been true for a very long time. There was a World Economic Outlook uh, uh, pre press conference today, um, which I'm sure you'll read about. Uh, and, and, and so, uh, as again, been mentioned, uh, many central banks are struggling to push inflation expectations up to 2%. I, I've spoken with some central bank central bankers in the United States who say, well, 
long-term expectations are a little below 2%. That's fantastic. I mean, that just means we've really anchored expectations. I, I, I'm, more, I'm not so sure we should be so happy about that because I would say, and maybe I'm just old, but my reading of the tea leaves, uh, looking at some of the proposals that are out there for how to run the government from both the left and the right, it could happen that you have inflation again in the United States. I mean, really, uh, you, let's say it's a 3% chance or a 5% chance over the next 20 to 30 years. And that ought to be in expected inflation. I think it used to be, if you went back 10 years, that the normal inflation might be 2 and 2.5%. Two and but let's remember there were markets in 2011, 2013 paying to insure against you know, inflation being more than 5% a year for 10 years, uh, yeah, that, 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 that ought to be built in there. And it, it, uh, I think it undermines uh, uh, the credibility of central banks. And I, I, again, because I, I as Mike Bordeaux said, if you look at central banking today, a lot of the problems are in the advanced economies of what to do, of how to re-anchor things. Um, you you a actually can find uh, expectations in the U.S. at times of market interest rates going negative, even though the Federal Reserve, uh, putting some positive probability, even though the Federal Reserve has said that is, uh, has never happened. Um, so uh, th there is a question of uh, which many people ask about what to do if there's a recession, what ammunition do central banks have? And let me just brief, you know, say uh, Ben Bernanke said quantitative easing doesn't work in theory, doesn't work in practice. Let me dwell for a second on the fact it doesn't work in theory. And if, if we're talking about quantitative easing of the central bank buying government bonds, uh, it's basically shortening the maturity structure of government debt. The Treasury owns, in every country, the central bank lock, stock, and barrel. There is no balance sheet independence of any central bank. It has certain operational independence. So what ought to matter, in theory, for the uh, private sector is the portfolio that they hold of government debt. And it ought to be the case that if the Treasury really wanted to shorten debt, it could issue uh, one-week debt. In fact, in the US, I think they can issue much shorter debt. They haven't. But one week debt actually pays a lower interest rate than the Fed funds rate because it's more liquid than uh, Fed funds. There's nothing that the Fed does that the Treasury couldn't do. The US Treasury has turned over an average of $4 trillion a year in Treasury bills. And that's you know what the, about what the Fed hit in its portfolio at the maximum. And I, I, I never know these days if it's okay to make a military analogy, but uh, if you look at, uh, you know, the Navy has uh, airplanes, uh, the Marines have troops, and sure, you know, you can have the Marines do certain things with their troops, but if you really have a big war, you're going to use the Army. You can have the Navy do some things with their planes, but if you're really going to have a big aerial combat, you're going to use the Air Force. The, the, the Federal Reserve is a junior partner in the maturity transformation relationship. Every central bank is. They can do something quickly, uh, certainly in a crisis. They're, if they're doing something outside the box, they can move more quickly. But um, it's, it's, it's hard to see that this is a long-term instrument you can lean on. I admit, markets were way confused. And the central banks, I think, in their communications contributed a lot to this because they were trying to pretend like they had control over everything. So I, I think this issue of what the balance sheet is is one that's, uh, that's very important. Um, because people don't understand what the, uh, what the balance sheet is, uh, you get all these, uh, all these wacko ideas out there. And a favorite one of mine is, uh, is, is uh, uh, helicopter money. Um, oh, by the way, I should, say, I should just say, when the European Central Bank acts, it's different because there isn't a European-wide fiscal authority. And you can view uh, ECB policy as being a de facto uh, 
euro bill that they're issuing to buy up euro debt. It has an effect because the rich countries are subsidizing the poorer countries and that leads to some stimulus that is different. And if it's private sector, uh, if it's private sector quantitative easing, which I call fiscal quantitative easing, yes, that also has an effect. Uh, but if you're doing it on scale, it's not so obvious that it's something you want to charge the, uh, the central bank with doing. If the central bank's forced to do that, it interferes with its independence. I think that was a point that was made in yesterday's, uh, yesterday's discussion. So uh, a, a favorite idea of mine that uh, people have out there is the idea of helicopter money. And again, Ben Bernanke's actually kind of tried to defend this at times because he it was sort of a slip of the tongue almost once in a speech he gave. And helicopter, the helicopter money is just nonsense. Um, of you, the, it has the, the central bank printing money and giving it to people. And it's not just the press that seems to believe this. I meet graduate students who are telling me this is a great idea all the time and the Fed should be, uh, have this. And of course, the, the Fed is unelected. Paul Tucker has a wonderful book uh, on elected power about, uh, with this theme. And if you're doing that very much, believe me, you're not going to be independent for very long. Uh, Bernanke has a variant of this where he says, well, we won't choose who gets the money. We'll just choose how much money is going to get spent. And it, it's, it's not really going to save you if the Federal Reserve's making decisions like that. These are fiscal decisions. Again, there, there's nothing wrong with the central bank being charged with some fiscal decisions, uh, just as the Navy has some airplanes and the Marines have troops and you, you, you can have the central bank have many activities. But I think it's a problem to confuse uh, what, uh, what they are. And I, I realize I'm speaking more about advanced country central banks because in many emerging markets, the financial markets are less developed and the central bank transparently is taking on all these roles uh, and has the competency to take on all these roles. Um, when it comes to dealing with financial crises, nobody debates that the, the, the central bank should take on a quasi-fiscal role because it can move quickly without the legislature, it has regular ties with the financial sector, uh, it has, uh, it, it's able to do things quickly, but nobody views this as a sustained effort. In most emerging markets when this happens, if the loans go bad, they get put into a special purpose vehicle, the government takes it over. There was, of course, a lot of debate about that within Europe about, uh, about what would be done. Uh, nobody debates that the central bank uh, should have uh, some of these broader powers, but it's um, when, you, when you're trying to do this on a regular basis, and I, there are lots of proposals out there. Let, let me mention another one besides helicopter money. Uh, when I came out with my book about the past, present, and future of money in 2016, one of the reviewers said, well, there's no reason you ever need to think about negative interest rates because if you want to stimulate the economy, you just follow Bernanke's idea. And I don't really think this was quite his idea, but the author also claimed it was uh, his idea. You just, the central bank just tears up government debt. Problem solved. And this is so idiotic, I don't have words for it because of course that's like, you know, when I tear up debt from someone in my family, it doesn't change our family's balance sheet. And because the Federal Reserve is owned by the Treasury, it doesn't change their balance sheet. It could lead to a situation where the Federal Reserve uh, needed, we start to get inflation, the Federal Reserve didn't have any assets to buy back debt, and well, actually it can issue assets, but maybe it would run into trouble and you'd get inflation. But this is sort of a Russian roulette way of trying to raise inflation expectations. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a serious idea. So there, there, there are just a huge number of ideas uh, out there which I think run into this, uh, this basic misconception of uh, what, it is that, uh, what it is that central banks do. And I, I, um, you know, I want to be careful to say it doesn't mean the central bank can't have different roles. But if you're having problems with monetary policy, telling the Federal Reserve or the central bank it should do more fiscal policies, not really solving the problem of the mix 
Uh, let me just come back, come to one uh, final point on, on, of challenges to central banks and this belief that they're no longer needed as bulwarks against inflation. And we have this in the United States and the modern monetary theory, and which is neither monetary nor a theory, but, um, and I don't really see it written down coherently anywhere, but as best I understand it, you run giant deficits to pay for worthy progressive causes, and you pay for it by telling the Federal Reserve it has to do quantitative easing in order to pay for everything. Uh, if quantitative easing consists of interest-bearing assets like the Federal Reserve currently issues, it's just saying you should issue short-term debt. It's something that the Treasury could perfectly well uh, do for itself. Um, Olivier Blanchard had an interesting and provocative paper at the American Economic Association meetings where he basically argues the world seems to be in a permanently inefficient equilibrium where you could issue more debt uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's not, uh, it, it could be a free lunch. Um, I think there are a number of debatable points that I think you, you have to look at the returns on real assets, on equity and other assets and not just the return on debt to decide that you're in a inefficient equilibrium. And that's sort of famously what uh, uh, Abel, uh, Mankiw, Summers, and Zackhauser did in their review of economic studies paper. Um, I, I, I think, of course, it's a fair view that the US particularly can issue a lot more debt because the world's becoming more and more dollar-centric. And, uh, uh, but, um, I, I, I think that's questionable. And another point that Olivier says in his paper that one might debate is he, he acknowledges there are multiple equilibria problems. You could, uh, he appealing to like a, a, a model like Guillermo Calvo's where it seems okay and then it's not. And he says, but you know, as far as I can see, it doesn't really matter what your debt level is. And that's not true in Guillermo's model. It's not true in the many other applications. It does matter. There's a very nice paper by Emmanuel Farhi uh, and Matteo Maggiore in the Quarterly Journal of Economics last year looking at how safe are safe assets. And they basically have a Calvo type model and show that, well, in the, in, this, in the equilibrium where you might be vulnerable, it's very tempting for the center country here in the United States, it's very tempting to issue more and more debt because the risks are borne by everybody when the system blows up. And they give uh, a, a very nice history at the beginning of the paper saying if you look back, this has happened before and safe things don't always turn out to be safe. And I could go on to the modern monetary theory, I'll skip it. But you know, the basic point is that if you're never gonna need inflation, if you're never gonna have inflation and you can just keep issuing more debt, you certainly have less need for an independent central bank. That was one of the core problems. So an another, another, reason, uh, another reason that uh, you don't need to have it. Um, so uh, I, I, do, I do think um, there are these pressures, not just of the Jeremy Corbyn, people's quantitative easing, and Donald Trump's tweets about how interest rates uh, should be lower, and at least in the run up to the election. Uh, I, I, I think there are certain, certain deeper problems. One of the problems is, I would say, excessive dogmatism, and one of the problems is the lack of adequate instruments. As far as the excessive dogmatism, I do think these ideas of escape clauses, building in some flexibility is very important to have in your algorithm. And I, I think in the 2008 crisis, although central banks are heroes of it, it's also true they stuck to their inflation targets. And if you were doing it again, that didn't make sense. If you were gonna have an exit from when you, I'm not saying they could have, but when you would have relaxed your inflation targets, uh, I, I thought that was a good, I, I wrote and thought that was a good idea at the time. Uh, that would have been good. But also in the run-up to the, the uh, in the run-up to the financial crisis, there were people, uh, I mean, John Taylor most pointedly, but Raghu Rajan, many others. Uh, I wouldn't include myself in there, but I'm not necessarily saying they, these others were wrong, who said, you know, uh, you're looking at inflation a little too much and financial instability a little too little. And if you had allowed interest rates to go up a bit, it would have helped. 
Uh, Jeremy Stein, uh, my colleague, has a great phrase about this, that financial regulation is not perfect and monetary policy fills in the cracks. And again, there's a certain dogmatism where the central banks said, well, inflation's fine, don't look at us. Uh, and, and, and so I, I do think there's some rethinking of that. But let me l lastly come to the question of uh, instruments. Um, I get, uh, I, I don't know what experience you've had, Mike, but I, I've gotten death threats for writing about uh, negative interest rates. The banking lobby does not like it, uh, to say the least. Uh, and um, just to make, this is sort of a topic for a whole other discussion, but in, in my view, um, if you laid the groundwork for effective negative interest rate policy, which involves regulation, it involves legal changes, but I would say nothing earth shattering in my opinion. Um, you could have steep negative interest rates in response to a financial crisis, in response to a deep recession if you needed them. Uh, the, so two of, the, uh, they're, they're two of the obstacles to this are cash hoarding uh, and the fact that uh, deposit rates uh, are sticky below zero. The cash hoarding is certainly a very solvable problem. My 2016 book lays out a number of ideas. Uh, Mike Gordo and Andy Levin lay out ideas also for this. Uh, uh, Rucher Agarwal and Miles Kimball have written about this. But I mean, you, you, you need to prevent the arbitrage into cash. This is not very hard compared to all of the ideas in, the, if you look at the Quarterly Journal of Economics, the American Economic Review, the top journals are just littered with papers of what I would describe as wacko ideas for dealing, dealing with the zero bound. Let's not have structural reform anymore, uh, helicopter money. Raising inflation targets, by the way, I think the best of them, but flawed for a number of reasons. It's, it's not flawed, it's much weaker for a number of reasons. Uh, and I, I don't think these are any so difficult to do. You don't have to get rid of cash. You don't have to do anything about cash. You need to basically find a way to tax large deposits of cash. You can, uh, my book details, you can exclude 99.9% .9 of people by uh, having the government give zero interest accounts to people because you're not doing it to make money. You're doing it in order to stimulate the economy. And if you blocked uh, wholesale arbitrage into cash, uh, I, I would say that I, I will venture that the problem that uh, wholesale bank deposits couldn't go negative would just not be a problem. That would be the only competitive equilibrium. Uh, and it's by, certainly by far the cleanest solution. Uh, there's a number of things you could do to lay the groundwork for this in terms of uh, different angles on this. One I prefer would be getting li rid of large currency notes, which I think would be a very good idea anyway, getting rid of $50 and $100 bills. I, I wrote about this more than 20 years ago, um, I, uh, which are mostly used for in, uh, in most countries for tax evasion and secondarily crime and various things that you could do to make, uh, make uh, hoarding more difficult. There's a, a very a beautiful idea that was introduced by Robert Eisler that probably many of you have seen. He introduced in the early 1930s of creating a dual exchange rate system. It's not perfect either, but the challenges are not so great. The dual exchange rate system makes electronic money the, the official currency uh, and creates an exchange rate at the central bank that's moving between the electronic currency and the paper currency. It, they're not perfect substitutes. That's one of the problems in this model. That's why we can have negative interest rates today. But I think there are uh, many ways to do this. Now, um, there are all sorts of arguments given against why this is impossible, that the world will blow up. And I, I, I found a reference that Milton Friedman, from Milton Friedman when he talked about the move to floating exchange rates. And he wrote about that in the early 1950s. And everybody said, this will be the end of the world. If you have floating exchange rates, the markets aren't going to be able to handle it. They're going to blow up. And then to quote uh, Milton, Milton Friedman in an interview, uh, he referred to the 1951 episode where the Fed abandoned its bond price pegging program. And he said, before the Federal Reserve gave up the pegging of bond prices, we heard all over the lot 
that a free market in bonds was going to be chaotic, that the interest rate might go heaven high or down, there might be capital losses, savings institutions might be wiped out by their capital losses, and that we needed a basic peg on which market could form anticipation. We abandoned the peg price, nothing happened. And you can say the same thing about flexible exchange rates. And I, I think a lot of that hysteria applies to uh, negative interest, effective negative interest rate policy. There are very strong lobby groups against this. Uh, I, will, I, I will predict every central bank will be doing this in 10 years unless we have a reversal of where interest rates are going because everything else is, uh, is, is so superficial. I don't expect it in the next recession. Most central bankers will quietly say in the next recession, we'll do fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is great. You should do fiscal policy when you do monetary policy, but it's not as nuanced. When fiscal policy in the United States, when the Democrats are in, means the government should be as big as possible. When the Republicans are in, it means that the, the government should be as small as possible with tax cuts. Since everybody knows that it's a knife edge split uh, over which side's going to prevail, it's extremely unstable. Alberto uh, Alessina and Guido Tabellini wrote papers about this almost 30 years ago. So did Lars Svensson uh, and Torsten Pearson. Um, it's, it should be used, and it, th it will be given a try, but I think people are going to generally be, uh, find it uh, being uh, much less effective. So let me just conclude with one last point. I've talked about central banking, things it can do. There's a lot of talk in the last third of my book is about the future of digital currencies and where things can go. I, I, I do think one thing which is not a threat to the future of central banking are currencies like the Libra and Bitcoin and any private digital currency. They're not a threat to central banking anymore than credit cards, checks, uh, uh, smartphone payments are a threat to central banking. Uh, they, they, these are regulatory arbitrage by and large. Uh, when regulation comes in and they're forced to have things like anti-money laundering, you know, really obey it, uh, all the different structures that financial institutions have and if they become big, I don't think that's an issue. But I do think it's an issue. I do, I do think it's an inevitable future. I talk about it a bit in my book, and Mike and uh, Andy Levin uh, lay this out in quite a bit of detail, that central banks will have digital retail currencies. They won't be quite as retail as you can get from a bank. I think they'll be somewhat more limited, would be my guess. <clears throat> I would like to mention this already exists in the United States, actually, uh, but it's from the Treasury. You can go into the U.S. Treasury website, and you can uh, go to U.S. Treasury Direct. You can buy up to $20 million, as little as $100. You are directly holding assets at the U.S. Treasury. You can trade them with other people within the system. Uh, there's quite a bit of flexibility. It's nascent. It's more like a postal savings account than it is a retail currency. But this is something that already exists. The, I think the main reason the government doesn't advertise it more is they're a little nervous. People would like it too much, and they're worried about the kinds of problems that arise uh, when we have um, digital currencies replace banks. But certainly, uh, when we're thinking about negative interest rates, the, this is uh, and subsidizing people uh, and not subsidizing wholesale bars. The, the technology for this totally exists. Uh, I, th I think a lot of the pushback is from lobbying groups. Uh, maybe some idea like this will get implemented and then, excuse me, suddenly we'll have a crisis, uh, a shock that's different than anything we've expected in the past and it'll become irrelevant. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm not so sure when that's going to happen. Um, and then lastly on that note, uh, we have seen this steady fall in interest rates, which is something that's just dominated the financial landscape. I, I, my whole uh, second, uh, second year, I teach the first year graduate course, the second part of it, uh, uh, half of the second part of it, and the whole course is devoted to different models of why the interest rate has come down. We have a good 10 of them or so. We're not really sure which one is which. We're not really sure what's going to happen. 
uh, you ask most people and they say, if there's another big shock, interest rates will go down further. And I, I think that's a real example of this time is different mentality that whatever happened last time is what's going to happen next time. And I, I don't know what the shock's going to be, but uh, I wouldn't be so sure. Uh, and uh, that would be another reason to keep independent central banks uh, in our portfolio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken, for a very provoc provocative uh, discussion. Should I come over here? Sure, sure, please. Uh, we have time for, uh, for questions. Yes. So, so I had, um, that was a great talk. Um, I have uh, one comment and one question. The comment is just to add that uh, modern monetary theory is not modern either, since the original ideas go back to functional finance ideas from the 40s, so um, it's none of its names. Um, the question is, I'm sort of, I wouldn't mind if you would elaborate a bit on your point about raising inflation targets, because you had said that if central banks lose independence, you thought that quite quickly inflation credibility would disappear and you know we'd be back to a, a sort of an earlier time and yet i wonder if even an independent central bank raising an inflation target at a time when they're struggling to get inflation to their relatively low target wouldn't have the same effect on inflation credibility First of all, I, I, I wouldn't say that if we didn't have independent central banks, inflation would go up right away. It'll, if we get, you know, I, I don't want to name a politician, but let's say a, a very uh, Stalinist politician in, in power in your country, um, you're not going to have 20% inflation overnight. I mean, we saw the, uh, we saw the graph of uh, what happened in Chile in the early 70s. I, that's not going to happen. But in 10 years, it might. I mean, the, these, these things don't unfold overnight. And I, again, I, I actually think the, pay, the, the Calvo model, the paper that Farhi and Maggiore have uh, paint that. I, so, so it's not a short answer to raising inflation targets. To me, it's a less, it's, it's, a, it's a much more reasonable idea than others. It's not my favorite idea. You're absolutely right. It's very hard to say it now. It has to be something you do opportunistically and wait till somehow miraculously inflation goes up and then say that you're not going to bring it down. Uh, Stan Fisher's made a point that came up in yesterday's conversation, that, uh, and I guess Ricardo has it in some of his uh, early work with uh, Greg about, Greg Mankiw about, you know, people's attention span. If you start making inflation 4% and you assume you're going to have the identical contracts and everything's going to change exactly the same way, I think that's naive. I'm aware of Nakamura and Steinson's paper about the 70s. And nevertheless, I would say if you had this in place for 20 or 30 years, we're just not going to have the same contracts. And I, I, I give examples in my book about where it's possible you raise the inflation targets to 4% and contracts respond more quickly and you might end up not having any more ammunition than you started with because monetary policy is less effective. So those were great, great remarks, Ken. Uh, I just want to follow up on um, these new payment technologies like Libra that you mentioned. Uh, and I guess among the risks that people raise is one, I mean, this is also meant for, for cross-border payment. So it's not just about within-country payment. So the question is that for countries that have... Uh, and for, the, for whom the currency is not the dollar or not the reserve currency, does this then bring in the risk of currency substitution in these countries? Is this kind of a, a risk of bringing in, uh, 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 you know, people might start holding these particular, you know, the Libra, which is ultimately backed by, uh, by reserve currencies. Then, of course, there is also the question about uh, data protection. Um, uh, and, then, and then the question is whether eventually, right now it's mostly a payments technology, but then will it eventually morph into, uh, as unit of account, do people start pricing in this particular? So do, it, does, do these risks seem, um, seem real to you, Ralvid? Well, <clears throat> I, I say I discuss this stuff at length in my book, and I, but the quick answer is, um, if you look at the history of currency, uh, the private sector 
quite possibly invented standardized coinage before the, the king of Lydia was doing it. Uh, paper currency, the private sector invented, to the extent that there's some technology. I think most uh, that's new, the government eventually will usurp it. There, if you talk to some of these people, they uh, you know, will just pretend they have better tools, they will win. The government makes the rules, and it may not win right away, but if it wants to win, it will always win. And so I think we'll see uh, regulation, uh, particularly of the crypto part of this, which is uh, uh, you know, certainly a big attraction to it in cross-border payments and hiding things. Eventually, that's going to become much less liquid. You won't be able to use it in store, retail stores or in banks. I'm actually very careful not to claim Bitcoin will be worthless because there'll be countries like North Korea, Iran. The U.S. has financial sanctions on 12 countries at the moment. And so some, some countries are incentivized to misbehave, to use things that undermine the system. But I, 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 think, there, I think this is a question of where the regulators are behind, but they'll catch up. Yes. Um, so thank you for this uh, two to four. Uh, you have you list a lot of lot of problems, and I wonder whether some of these problems are to what degree they are real, and to what degree they are our our own creation, so to speak. And and take the example of too low inflation. Now, so the question is, what does that mean? When we introduced uh, inflation targeting, the problem was that inflation was too high. And we wanted to sell to the public that we could change that. So we uh, were rather tight in our specification of the target, many of us. So we are going to, we can deliver 2% infl inflation. And, uh, and somehow uh, this, the target has become a bit too strict. So inflation is 1.6%. The general public in many countries find it difficult to understand why that is a problem and why it is a mega issue to get up, up to 2% tomorrow with all the means that we have at our disposal. And um, I think uh, we should learn a bit from the Australians because they have an inflation target that is less well specified. They say 2.5% over the cycle, which means that uh, where the, when, if you are uh, at 2%, nobody is saying anything. Uh, uh, and it matters a lot why inflation is below the target. If, for instance, was the case in my country and many other small open economies, that inflation was below the target because you were being hit by very strong positive uh, supply shocks. So, so foreigners wanted to sell you stuff cheaply and, and, and they were buying uh, expensively from you. So what is the problem with that? And, 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 that, and, and you were at full employment, the strong growth at the same time. So, uh, and if I look a little bit, even at the Eurozone at the moment, in the US at the moment, there's a problem. Okay, people say, yes, inflation expectations, that is, that is a problem. But I don't have a recollection when uh, inflation was slightly above target and long-term inflation expectations were maybe a few percentage points above, that that was seen as a major issue because we know that they uh, fluctuate a bit with, with current inflation. So what, what do you say to that? Well, I mean, those are very, very good points that you raise. Uh, I prefer the idea of long-term, slowly, not overnight, introducing effective negative interest rate policy and not changing the inflation target and not worrying about it so much because part of the reason central banks worry about it is they don't know what they're going to do uh, if you end up like Europe or end up the Eurozone or end up like Japan and you're at the zero bound and you become uh, relatively uh, shackled. You're all familiar with these, uh, these kinds of statistics. I, I second, secondly would say that in, in my 1985 paper, there's sort of an optimal weight to put on your target. It's not 100%. And I, I, I admit it's crude, and I think people have done, I, I've mentioned papers that have done it, I think, more elegantly than I did. But I certainly had in mind the idea that 
you had to retain some flexibility for dealing with unforeseen circumstances. And there, there, there are multiple things that the central bank's trying to achieve. And if you just achieve your inflation target perfectly, the, I actually use an envelope theorem in my paper to repeatedly in saying, well, if you hit one thing perfectly, you're probably putting too big a weight on that. And maybe, maybe that's the case. Yes. Um, Ken, just on your comment about fiscal policy, I mean, I, I can see how that's specific to the U.S., but for other jurisdictions, wouldn't sort of expanding or enhancing automatic stabilizers be the, the optimal thing to do? Because allowing the, the fiscal authorities to have better automatic stabilizers would allow central banks to incorporate that in their projections. And so we wouldn't have to coordinate with the fiscal authority in real time. Better fiscal policy is great. Uh, I often hear in various uh, settings, somebody say, let's just have more automatic stabilizers. Yeah, but, but kind of ignoring that has incentive effects. And so, uh, of course, the extent you can design automatic stabilizers that don't have deleterious incentive effects, that's a good idea. Uh, so I'm not against having stronger social safety net, great idea, uh, and having it kick in more automatically. There's a question of to what degree you could do it. But my views are about monetary policy, not fiscal policy. I'm not, I'm not denigrating fiscal policy or saying you shouldn't use fiscal policy. But I do think it's a problem when you don't have monetary policy. There's, it's, it's so hard to calibrate fiscal policy. Fiscal policy is not a single thing. It's, it's uh, tax cuts, investment. Uh, I, I, it's actually curious to me, so many economists agree infrastructure spending would be great. Everybody should do infrastructure spending. Infrastructure spending in advanced economies accounts for about 4% of government uh, spending. But I, I don't see anybody laying out plans of having contingent infrastructure projects, for example. Uh, and, I, and I think that partly reflects the incredible politicization of the debate. So, you know, if you talk to a progressive, they're going to say, well, yeah, let's have much stronger automatic stabilizers because let's distribute income more and it's great. Uh, and I, I, I think we're on the wrong side of that in the United States. We should do much more. But it's, it's, not, a, it's not something on which there's a synthesis. And again, I would I point to these papers by uh, Pearson and Tavellini. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Spent getting them mixed up. They all write with each other. Spence, Pearson and Spenson and Alessina and Tavellini each had papers sort of in this general issue uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. Okay, one, one last question. Yes. So, Ken, how do we get to a world of uh, <clears throat> central bank digital cash and negative interest rates? What's the, what's the strategy? <laughs> You want me to refer people to your paper? No, no. I mean, what do you think? I mean, how would you do it? I know we have a, we have a strategy. <laughs> I mean, I, I, digital currency. Di central bank digital assets, not all currencies, are coming. Uh, the technology exists. As I said, the, the, again, I mentioned this <coughs> idea of the military. You, know, you don't have to have the Fed provide that. The Treasury could perfectly well provide it. In the United States, it's arrived. I mean, we certainly have digital savings that are phenomenally flexible, zero costs. You get great rates uh, on, on everything. Uh, the technology is pretty straightforward because it's not doing a lot of uh, uh, transactions. There's a question of in central bank digital currencies, how liquid can you make it? How, how much can you have central bank digital currencies really perfectly substitute for the services uh, smaller participants have, and that will get explored. Um, but it's a coming world. Um, there's, uh, th you know, there are a lot of changes coming in the financial sector that uh, the, uh, all the big tech platforms want to compete with the banks at the same time. Uh, so I think there'll be a lot of action on this front. But there, there's no question cash is becoming yet less and less used in the real, in real economy. 
the supply of cash is going up, but the, all the surveys from every central bank show that the usages are fading. That makes it politically easier and easier to rely more on, on digital currency. And the negative interest rates, as I said, I mean, I think it's one of these things where, you know, we'll get to that answer after we've tried everything else. Uh, but it, it may take some, but if, if real interest rates stay this low, I, I really don't see a plan B. Okay, thank you very much. Let's close with a round of applause.